Ezekiel chapter 36. Ezekiel chapter 36. Cover a little bit more ground tonight. Want to go to possibly some more t uh, New Testament places if we get time to do so. But Ezekiel chapter 36. These passages will, they don't specifically mention the new covenant, but they do uh, correlate with Jeremiah's description of conditions under the new covenant. Let's start with Ezekiel 36 and verse 24. Ezekiel 36, verse 24. Let me open with a word of prayer. Father, we pray that this second session tonight together in the study of your word is profitable for you and for us as we fulfill your plan. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Ezekiel 36, verse 24. I will take you from the nations and gather you from all the countries and bring you into your own land. I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you shall be clean from all your uncleanness, uncleanlesses. And from all your idols, I will cleanse you. Um, yeah, it's uh, uh, uncleannesses. Okay, there we go. Let me read that again. <laughs> Verse 25. I will sprinkle water on you, and you will be clean from all your uncleannesses. And from all your idols, I will cleanse you. Now, this water is... I think this could be understood by most that it is symbolic. There are many symbols used in the Bible. We just have to be careful to uh, allow the Bible to speak to us in the clarity in which it speaks to us. This water is symbolic of spiritual cleansing. There's another important place where water is symbolic of spiritual cleansing, and that is in the baptism of John, where John baptized in the Jordan to uh, those who were repenting and preparing their minds for the coming of Messiah. And in fact, uh, water baptism, the, the water baptism of Paul, Saul of Tarsus, before he was known as Paul, but after his conversion, uh, he was water baptized, and that is associated in the book of Acts with the washing away of sins. Not that the water literally washed away sins, of course it didn't, but it had that, it symbolized the washing away of sins. Another place where water is symbolic of spiritual cleansing, you can hold your place in, a, in Ezekiel 36, but go there with me, to John chapter 3. The Gospel of John chapter 3. And in the, John, the Gospel of John, chapter 3, starting at verse 1. John 3, starting at verse 1. Now there was a man of the Pharisees called Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. 
Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Now, there are a number of uh, opinions on just what this being born of water and the Spirit is, and there are those who say, oh, that's water baptism. Well, I don't believe that, but I do believe it is water used symbolically as water was used symbolically uh, under the baptism of John, and uh, as water is used symbolically in Titus 3, 5, not by works of righteousness, which you have done, but according to his mercy you have been saved by the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Spirit. And water is used symbolically uh, in Ephesians 5.26 for the washing of water by the word by which the church has been cleansed which is also related to regeneration. These water symbolizes or emphasizes several different things in the Bible, but they're all interrelated. In John chapter 4, in his interview with a woman at the well in Samaria, uh, the Lord Jesus Christ referred to the living waters available uh, meaning eternal life, which is which is related to regeneration, which is related to being born again, which is related uh, to the Word of God. In fact, Peter writes of being born again, and then he uses the the symbol of seed, not of seed which is corruptible, but of the incorruptible seed, the word of God. So we we have an inner relationship here with some of these symbols. But uh, the, this water back in, uh, I believe, in John chapter 3 and back in Ezekiel, uh, 20, Ezekiel 36 here. Ezekiel 36. So in Ezekiel 36, let's take it from verse 24 again. I will take you from the nations and gather you from all the countries and bring you into your own land. I will sprinkle clean water on you and you shall be clean from all your uncleannesses and from all your idols. I will cleanse you and I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you. By the way, that, that's symbolic too, obviously. It's not a literal heart of stone that they had. It's not a literal uh, heart of flesh he was referring to. They already had flesh hearts. And in any case, heart and its common usage in the Old Testament means mind, not the, the organ. But a lot of symbolism going on. We just need to, to uh, separate it accurately and not assume uh, symbolism where symbolism is not. But let's look at the uh, Verse 26 again, And I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you, 
and I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. In other words, I'll, I'll take that calloused way of thinking out and instill within you a, a an attitude of thinking that is sensitive toward spiritual things. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. Now, I will cause you. Does that mean he will force these people who are in yet unglorified bodies in Messiah's kingdom. Is he going to force them to obey him? Well, obviously not, because uh, by the end of the millennium, many of the people, uh, as uh, I believe uh, it states in Revelation 20, uh, as many as the numbers of, of the sand on the shore, uh, more symbolism, or I guess that would be hyperbole, but there is going to be a huge, huge rebellion against the Lord Jesus Christ by human beings who are still in their mortal bodies. They're just going to be, be briefly allowed to do what they've been thinking all along. They've been, in other words, they've had, uh, they've had mental attitude problems against the Lord throughout the millennium, but now uh, they'll be allowed for a brief time to express how they were thinking. But they're not going to be forced to obey the Lord. But what is going to happen is they will be more inclined to obey the Lord than not inclined. We, on the other hand, uh, in our mortal bodies, are, are usually more inclined to disobey God than to obey him. And we have to check that with the power of the Holy Spirit and faith in God so that we will... Uh, we will allow the Holy Spirit to do its work as we identify with all Christ is and everything he has and allow the, and we put off the old man, uh, that is the, the uh, we, we put off our being as controlled by the sin nature and put on the new. That is, the, 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 we operate in our new nature under uh, the, the uh, direction of the Holy Spirit, walking by means of the Holy Spirit instead of, of following the lusts of our flesh and the, the temptation of the enemy. But, we, but these people won't be forced. They'll just be under much better conditions than we are since Satan is going to be bound during the 1,000-year reign of Christ and the Holy Spirit is going to dwell within his people as we uh, just read about. Then things are really going to be conducive toward obeying God's rules, which are, which are enucleated in the Sermon on the Mount. So it's quite a, uh, it's quite a requirement, and yet the sufficiency will be there to do so. In verse 28, you shall dwell in the land that I give to your fathers, and you shall be my people, and I will be your God. Okay, now, let's consider what happened at Pentecost, uh, but we won't, get, we won't get into that just yet. We'll go back to Luke chapter 24. We'll tie this all together in five minutes. Uh, 
or four minutes. Luke chapter 24. Luke 24. Jesus Christ to his disciples. Luke 24, verse 49 uh, is all we'll, we'll do tonight because we've, we've been in this recently and been actually preparing for this just three sessions ago, I believe. Luke 24, 49, And behold, I am sending the promise of my Father upon you. But stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. And so the promise of, of the Holy Spirit would come up on them. And when did that come? At Pentecost and through the Pentecostal era. And it is mentioned several times, uh, the, a number of times, that the Holy Spirit came upon them. It is also stated that they were filled with the Holy Spirit, those in the upper room at Pentecost. That's in Acts chapter 2. You can turn there with me. Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2. Starting at verse 1, When the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place, and suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting, and divided tongues as of fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And filled is properly translated, and I can uh, point to even pre-Pentecostal instances, which uh, maybe I'll do next week, that, that use the same Word, same mood, tense, and voice uh, for being filled with the Holy Spirit uh, in the Gospels. And here they were filled all at one time, these 120 people in the upper room, and it was a spectacular thing. There came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind. It filled the entire house where they were sitting. Divided tongues as a fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them, and they were filled. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Do not confuse this with our being filled uh, and that, that can actually either be translated in Ephesians 5.18 with or by the Holy Spirit, uh, which is uh, basically another way of saying what Paul wrote to the Galatians, walk by means of the Holy Spirit. But this was a, a miraculous manifestation of the Holy Spirit whereby they, as the writer to the Hebrews wrote in Hebrews 6, verse 5, they tasted the goodness of the word of God and the powers of the age to come. And then Peter goes on to explain, we've been through it all many times, Exactly what was going on, it was the beginning of the fulfillment of what Joel had prophesied in the last days uh, in Joel chapter 2. Now, uh, if you will turn with me to Ephesians chapter 3, and this is where we will close tonight. Ephesians chapter 3. And this is on that same night, I believe it was three sessions ago, 
maybe two sessions ago, we looked at the same passage after we looked at, at Luke 24. It's in the revelation of the mystery to the Apostle Paul. I'll go ahead and take it from 3-1 because we have a, a couple minutes left before the bell goes off. Ephesians 3, starting at verse 1, For this reason I, Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus, on behalf of you Gentiles, assuming that you have heard of the stewardship or administration or fellowship of God's grace that was given to me for you, or dispensation of God's grace, as it is translated uh, in some outstanding translations, that was given to me for you, how the mystery was made known to me by revelation, as I have written briefly. When you read this, you can perceive my insight into the mystery of Christ, which was not made known to the sons of men in other generations, as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. The mystery is that the Gentiles are fellow heirs, fellow members of the same body, and partakers of the promised in Christ Jesus through the gospel. Now, it wasn't a mystery that God would save the Gentiles. That's in the prophetic word that the Gentiles would be saved through Israel's agency. What was a mystery is that they would be saved through the temporary rejection of Israel by God, as the Apostle Paul explains in Romans chapter 11. And it wasn't a mystery... That this promise of the Holy Spirit was not a mystery. And it was fulfilled in a certain way at Pentecost. But what makes this promise of the Holy Spirit an aspect of the mystery revelation given to the Apostle Paul is the how, that is, how the Holy Spirit was given by God. It was not given as it was at Pentecost, where, yes, uh, these believers were in a m miraculous way with signs and wonders, all simultaneously filled with the Holy Spirit, but also the the baptism of the Holy Spirit was upon them, as it is mentioned in different times uh, throughout the Pentecostal era, upon them. But we receive the Holy Spirit as the Holy Spirit baptizes every new believer into Christ. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 13. And through this baptism of the Holy Spirit, all believers are also permanently indwelt by the Holy Spirit in Romans 8, 9 and 1 Corinthians 6, 19. So we are permanently indwelt by the Holy Spirit, but not in the way that the Pentecostal believers were filled with the Holy Spirit simultaneously in that upper room. And with that, we will close right on time tonight, I do believe, with a word of prayer. Father, thank you for everything you've given to us tonight tonight and thank you for the understanding you provide by the Holy Spirit and we pray with thanksgiving in the name of your son Jesus. 
Amen.